this video is really just an introduction to ideologies which we're going to start fairly soon and a term that we will come up with fairly frequently when we're studying ideologies is, is the enlightenment and some ideologies are pre-enlightenment and some are post-enlightenment so briefly what was the enlightenment well european politics philosophy science and communications were radically changed during the course of what was called the long 18th century from you know, the late 17th century to into the early 19th century as part of a movement referred to by its participants as the age of reason or simply we we'll call it the enlightenment and enlightenment thinkers in britain and france and throughout europe questioned traditional authority and traditional ways of doing things and embraced the notion that humanity we the world society could be improved through rational change and again that's an expression that we're going to come up with again and again as we're studying some of these ideologies ration, rational or rationalism uh, particularly liberalism and socialism that the world has a rational structure and the workings of the world can be explained in a rational way and individuals are rational beings able to make their own decisions so the Enlightenment produced numerous books and essays, inventions, discoveries, etc. And we'll see the American and French revolutions in particular were directly inspired by Enlightenment ideals. If you think through a pre-Enlightenment system, which would have been if you like, the feudal system, which overlaps with this age of Enlightenment, it was a very hierarchical, uh, very rigid society. Uh, you had the monarch, uh, at the top and you had the next layer and the next layer and then you had the vast amount of, of people were put into free men or serfs. There was no sense of individuals or individuality. So you had a very rigid structure, there no such um, concept as a social mobility. You know, if you were born in a village, the son of a baker, you would die in the village being a baker yourself. You had absolute rulers. Uh, monarchs um, based on the divine right of kings or queens they got their authority from god and lots of things of how society operated was based on tradition it was based on superstitions and it was based on assertions and often it was very mystical how people explain society and you could see this in you know witches being burned medicine was all about herbs and ways of doing things and there was no sense to try and explain things um, and again the divine right of kings as we've mentioned whereas from the enlightenment onwards this, this uh, challenge to the traditional way of looking at the world and seeking to explain how the world works and how it operates and that it has a rational structure um, and it was a big challenge to initially the what was accepted about science and maths uh, and those areas but it also then spills into how society is governed and how people should be treated um, a nice example of, of the enlightenment approach was uh, the french mathematician uh, laplace and he suggested that um, which kind of covers everything if a sufficiently intelligent being knew that present state of every particle in the universe it would be able to deduce the entire course of events for such an intellect nothing would be uncertain and the future just like the past will be present before its eye that the world has a rational structure and it operates in a predictable uh, and consistent manner like most scientists they believe that the universe enlightenment science was a complex clockwork machine set it going and its path was entirely predictable not just um, uh, other aspects of the world but human behavior as well and einstein you know a couple of hundred years later you know really echoed the same thought he says you know god does not play dice things do not happen by accident the world has a rational structure um so the age of enlightenment um, was or simply the enlightenment was to reform society using reason and challenge ideas grounded in tradition and faith so you can see where you know, conservatism immediately is going to come under a little bit of challenge there and advance knowledge through a scientific method the thinkers of the enlightenment 
believed in the shedding in the light of science and reason on the world and questioning traditional ideas and ways of doing things. Scientific revolution based on empirical observation, seeing how things actually work and not on spirituality and mysticism, gives the impression that the universe behaved according to universal or unchanging laws. We think of Isaac Newton here and the apocryphal story of you know, the apple falls on his head. You know, pre-enlightenment thinking Newton had rubbed his head and thinking must have been bad in a previous life or something terrible is happening here. But Newton doesn't really think, oh, what's making the apple fall? Is there some kind of forces in this universe that's causing this to happen? And can you then predict how other things would happen? So this provides a model for looking rationally, not just at how the world works, but human institutions. Because if, if the world operates in a rational way, well, then that spills into how humans operate in society. Do individuals operate rationally? And is there a rational way for people to govern or to rule themselves? So Rousseau, for example, begins to question the idea of the divine might of kings. In the social contract, which was this would be revolutionary dangerous stuff to write at the time, he wrote that the king, the monarch, does not receive his power from God, but rather from what he calls the general will of the people. Um, this, of course, implies that people can also take away that power. You know, this could get your head cut off when Rousseau was writing. The Enlightenment thinkers also discussed other ideas that are the founding principles of any democracy. The idea of the importance of the individual who can reason for himself, and therefore the idea that individuals are equal and there should have equality under the law, and that they are born with what's called natural rights, which we see Locke calls them life, liberty and property. So the Enlightenment was a period of profound optimism, a sense of science and reason. Um, human beings and human society could improve and society could make progress. So some of the ideologies are Enlightenment ideologies, some are um, pre-Enlightenment, some post-Enlightenment. Some are Enlightenment thinkers, if you Google it, it's interesting what you get, because some of them are, if you call uh, scientific or mathematical Enlightenment thinkers, things like Descartes and Newton, and then some of them are, I suppose to call them philosophers like Locke, who come across from liberalism, and the idea of government based on consent, Montesquieu, who talked about the separation of powers, you know, Voltaire, most famous quote is, you know, I detest what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Uh, Rousseau, we've mentioned already, uh, Descartes was a mathematician. Uh, dad joke about Descartes. Descartes' most famous well-known phrase is, I think, therefore I am. So Descartes walks into his local bar and the barman says, hey René, what do you have? A pint? Descartes rubs his chin and says, mm, I think not. And then he disappears. Work it out for yourself, I was saying. Um, but so the ideologies we're going to study are liberalism and socialism, for, which are seen as post-enlightenment ideologies, and then conservatism, for much of its history is, is uh, sorry, that should say pre-enlightenment, let me just change it as I'm doing it, although there is an element that is post-enlightenment as well. And then in paper two, we're going to look at feminism, which is post-enlightenment. So an ideology what is it that we're studying in ideologies? Well, a kind of a nice analogy is the stuff we've studied so far in paper one and paper two is if you like the form on top of the wave and constitutions and legislatures and parties and pressure groups and policies and so forth. That's, if you like, the superficial element of politics, what you see on the surface. Um, ideologies is really the undercurrents, what's driving these changes, what's driving these waves, the belief systems that underpin the systems and the beliefs that we have. Um, another kind of analogy would be a prism. Depending on what your ideology is, your beliefs, you look at society, the world, through a particular prism. So, for example, if you're a socialist, the prism you look at society through would be through the prism of class politics, through the modes of production, through capitalism be a system of exploitation. And that's how you would look at the world and that's how you would, they're the tools you would use to explain it. If you're a liberal, you look at society through the prism of individualism and how you can make the world better for individuals and you'd explain how the world operates. 
if you're a feminist, you look at society through the prism of gender and you'd be able to explain how the world works, how it doesn't work, using gender as the analytical tool to explain how it works. So an ideology then is simply a set of beliefs or opinions of a group or an individual and they affect our outlook on the world. It's our most closely held set of values and feelings and they filter um, or the act is a filter in which we see everything in everybody and often these beliefs are so close to us they're inherent or they're socialized and we don't realize they're there we simply think our beliefs are natural and obviously true so political ideologies uh, offer a certain set of beliefs or principles that seeks to explain how society works and or how it should work when we finish studying ideologies we're going to go back to um, another element in paper when we haven't done political parties because most parties or movements base their actions on a particular ideology but no political party represents what you would call a pure form of that ideology because they need to be broad churches they need to seek broad support in order to be successful or to be elected so as you will see the conservative party obviously draws on conservatism but they are not the same thing labor has its origins in socialism but they are not the same thing, the same way as the Liberal Democrats obviously draw on liberalism, but they're not the same thing. So we're going to do parties after we've done ideologies and see the parallels between them. So the traditional or core ideologies that we're going to study for paper one are liberalism, socialism, conservatism. In paper two, schools have a, a range of newer ideologies they can choose and the one we're going to look at is feminism. Um, and within all of these ideologies, uh, they're not uh, uniform, there's a dichotomy in them, there's a range of strands or traditions or tensions. Um, but in order to be coherent or seen as a single doctrine or a coherent ideology, each ideology has a number of core themes. And so with each ideology, we first of all look at the core themes, things that, that ideology has in common, and then we look at the tensions within those ideologies for example the tensions within liberal feminism and you have socialist feminists and you have radical feminists and it'll be the same for all three as well so enlightenment pre-enlightenment post-enlightenment and then the ideologies which we're going to start studying fairly soon